Thank you for joining us with Ask a Historian. I'm Matthew Wilkinson, historian with Heritage Mississauga. Please send in your questions and join us each week as we explore the history of the city of Mississauga. Like, subscribe, and follow us and stay up to date on all the heritage happenings with Heritage Mississauga. Matthew, our first question today comes from Rashid, and he would like to know, what is the story behind Ontario Street in Streetsville? What can you tell Rashid about this street and any connections to historic families in Mississauga? Thank you, Rashid, for your question. And the origins of Ontario Street and the north end of Streetsville tie directly to the Hyde family, who had a lasting impact on the history of Streetsville. Heman Hyde, the patriarch of the family, was a native of Vermont, and he uh, was born in 1771, and he died in 1836 in Streetsville. Heman and his wife Mary had three sons, John Church Hyde, Nathan Blood Hyde, and Alvin Hyde. And it's the eldest son, John Church, uh, that would have the biggest impact uh, in the Hyde family on the fortunes and development of Streetsville. Heman Hyde owned an inn in Streetsville known as Hyde's Inn, at the north, originally at the northwest corner of Main and Church Street in, uh, in Streetsville. The Hyde family would operate an inn in Streetsville for over 40 years. The Hydes also had a store and a dwelling at the corner of what would become uh, Ontario Street and Queen Street in the north end of Streetsville. Their inn would later become known as the Ontario House, and that was a short-lived name, but uh, one of the earliest indications of the name Ontario uh, attached to the inn. John, John Church Hyde, the eldest son, took over the tavern license for Hyde's Inn in 1831, and he sold it in 1847 to Daniel Rowe. John then bought 35 acres of land along the Credit River, including a mill site in 1848, to add to the seven acres he had bought in the previous year from Richard Tassler. And this extensive acreage, uh, amounting to over 40 acres of land along the Credit River, here is where John decided to develop the property and build, a, a, over time, a, a commercial empire, an, an industrial empire as well. It consisted of a flour mill, a sawmill, a stave factory, and a cooperage. He also built a new general store and a large, uh, which the general store became known as the Ontario Warehouse, which employed nine clerks, and adjacent to the store, a new house was built, considered to be one of the finest houses in the village. He called his mill complex the Ontario Mills, and that's where the name of the street uh, the, comes from, Ontario Mills. Um, an advertisement for the Ontario Mills in the early 1850s. These mills, now being in complete operation, the proprietor begs to announce to the, fa to the farming community, merchants and others, that he is prepared and always will be happy to grind or purchase their wheat. He also flatters himself that in consequence of the most approved and newest inventions in machinery which have in been introduced to the construction of his mills, he will be al always enabled to compete with all others in his line of business. The enormous expense the subscriber has undergone in the erection of his mills, with the view to the mutual advantage of himself and the public, have taken together with the fact that having one of the most experienced millers the U.S. could produce, induces him to look with confidence that he will be adequately supported in his enterprise. Uh, I guess that is a, a very uh, eloquent way of saying that he's in business and looking for customers. Uh, John also built at this time, early 1850s, uh, a three-story uh, reciprocity hotel. It was a brick hotel, and it was located at Queen and Ontario Street, replacing an earlier store and hotel business that were, that were located there. The hotel was the largest in the community at the time, had 60 bedrooms, a ballroom on the second floor, and held 500 guests, and a stable that could accommodate up to 50 horses. Concerts, balls, and public meetings were held in what came to be known as Hyde's Hall, though officially again the Recipro Reciprocity Hotel. Thomas Harris was the innkeeper of the Reciprocity during the 1860s until John Church Hyde and his wife and family moved to Petrolia, Ontario. Um, the story of going to Petrolia had to tie to events happening elsewhere in the world, and that was with the end of the Crimean War in 1856. John and many other flour millers were nearly ruined when the prices of the wheat market plunged following the uh, the Crimean War. Uh, but John was able to keep his head above water financially for some time uh, because he had diversified business interests. And in 1859, he was still described in Streetsville as a merchant miller, proprietor of the Ontario Mills. He also ran in local politics, serving as a reeve of Toronto Township, that's historic Mississauga, for a time. And meetings were often held in his hotel. 
In 1861, uh, John uh, John's Hotel Complex was acquired by the Goodrumer Mortz Company, who converted it to a flax mill. John then moved uh, from Streetsville to Petrolia, Ontario, near down in the Windsor area, and he was said to be exploring an emerging oil market. So obviously, his business interests uh, expanded beyond the mill complex. The uh, John passed away. Uh, John Church passed away uh, in 1876 in Petrolia, and the Brampton Conservator told the final chapter of his life. Who would uh, uh, John had once been called the moving spirit of Streetsville, Mr. J. C. Hyde, a former resident of Streetsville and a man well known to many readers of the Conservator, uh, of the Conservator, sorry, uh, died on Thursday last. He leaves a family in Petrolia. He was by every man looked upon as an upright man, a true friend of the friendless, and one whose hand was always open to render assistance to the needy. Peace to his ashes. What a lovely tribute to, to a, a man who was considered a moving spirit in the community. The former Ontario Mills complex succumbed to fire and was briefly the site of a hydro facility in Streetsville. Its ruins can still be found along the Credit River. The Reciprocity Hotel at Ontario and uh, Queen Street also burned down around 1902, although the exact date of the fire is uncertain, and the salvage bricks were reportedly used to build a factory in West Toronto. The site has never been built on and is now a parking lot adjacent to Trinity Anglican Church uh, in Streetsville. And so there, uh, Rashid, is the story of Ontario Street in Streetsville and uh, its name origin connected to the business enterprises of the Hyde family and notably John Church Hyde. So thank you. Matthew, we have a question from Simon, who's a teacher at West Credit Secondary School, and he would like to share with the students what was here before West Credit Secondary School and on the land and waterways around us. Thank you, Simon, for your question here on Ask a Historian. Uh, you're, you know, looking for the earlier history, you'd be surprised perhaps how much is, is, is readily there if, you, if you're able to spot it on the landscape. There are hints to our past all over, including throughout the Meadowville area and, and uh, even right adjacent to uh, West Credit Secondary School. Um, looking back on kind of our, our earliest references to, to human history here connects to uh, our indigenous past. Uh, a, a very close connection can be found nearby the school in the name of Lake Wabakane, uh, well, and also Wabakane Park and the nearby Wabakane Creek. Uh, the creek itself was dammed by a farmer in the 1930s to create what is uh, what would become a Lake Wabakane. Wabakane Creek itself uh, it takes its name in reference to Chief Wabakanine of the indigenous Mississaugas of the Credit River. There is some suggestion that the creek may have been within his family's winter hunting grounds, although there's no evidence beyond the place name to support this. We know that the, uh, the name Wabak Wabakane Creek appears on a topographic map from the 1920s, but is likely, uh, its usage is likely much older than that. Chief Wabakanine was uh, uh, signed Provisional Agreement 13A in 1805 and Treaty 14 in 1806. We'll come back to Treaty 14 in a few moments. There is a slight pronunciation and spelling difference between the modern uh, uh, lake name, uh, uh, Lake Wabakane, um, and uh, the, the chief's name, Wabakanine. Um, the, the chief's name translates as meaning white snow, likely indicating that he was born um, in the winter months. Uh, the primary association to our, our indigenous history in, in the Meadowvale area in Mississauga comes from the land itself, and specifically that of Treaty 19, which was signed between the Crown and the indigenous Mississaugas on October 28th of 1818. Treaty 19 is also referred to as the Adjutant's Treaty, and there were five indigenous chiefs who signed the treaty, two of whom were from the Credit River, them being uh, Adjutant's and Wegish Goldman, and we'll talk about them in one second. Second year. Uh, Chief Adjutant, or Adjutants as he was known, was also referred to as Captain Jim or James Adjutant and was a, one of the principal chiefs of the Credit River. Uh, and Chief Wagish Goldman, uh, who lived between 1764 and 1828, is the only chief who signed Treaty 14 and Treaty 19, or earlier and, and later treaties. He was known by several names, uh, including Okamapanes uh, and, uh, and John Cameron, amongst others. His name translates as Possessor of Day or He Who Possesses the Day. Adjutants and Wegish Goldman were the principal chiefs of the Eagle Clan at the, credit, at the River Credit, and the other three chiefs who signed Treaty 19 were uh, from the Otter Clan and were from the 12 and 60 Mile Creeks, respectively. 
uh, we don't know very much more about the the three chiefs, the, the three other chiefs that signed the treaty. After Treaty 19 was signed, uh, the treaty itself ceded 648,000 acres of land to the Crown. It was all, corresponds to all land north of modern Eglinton Avenue in Mississauga. The area was surveyed by Richard Bristol uh, in 1819 and opened for settlement. The property which we're looking at today that uh, associates directly with West Credit Secondary School uh, would, it was known as Lot 8, Concession 6 of West Huron, Ontario Street. And it was not granted for settlement until 1846. It's likely that there were leaseholders on the property prior to that. But in 1846, the Crown grants the property. Um, Richard Bristol, uh, the, the surveyor in 1819, uh, surveyed a cadastral grid system of roads. And abutting your modern school property was a historical right-of-way, a historical road, which is no longer evident on the landscape today. It was known as Fifth Line West, uh, Fifth Line West of the Center Road or the Center Point, which is here on Ontario Street. Uh, which is almost the, the fifth line west has almost completely vanished on the modern landscape, although ghosts of the former right of way remain. Uh, and you can find them if you know where to look. Uh, and uh, there, are, there is some evidence of it still, but uh, as a traveled right of way, it is, it is almost completely disappeared. Uh, in terms of the property itself, again, we're looking at Lot 8, Concession 6 of West Huron Ontario Street, uh, and it was uh, it consisted originally of 100 acres of land. It was granted by the Crown to Peter Cook in 1846. In 1851, Peter sold, he broke his property into two parcels, two 50-acre lots, and he sold the northern 50 acres to his son, Adam Cook, and in 1853, he sold the southern 50 acres to another son, William Cook. In 1855, John Miller, acting as an executor, sold, his, the, sold the, the southern 50 acres to John Cantillon. John Cantillon lived between 1800 and 1887. The Cantillon family originally came from Tipperary in Ireland and then settled near Godrich in Huron County. The Can Cantillons were related by marriage to the Cook family, uh, and that's likely how they came associated with this property after Peter Cook had originally been granted the property. Uh, in 1862, John Cantillon granted the 50-acre property to his son, William Cantillon. The property later reverted back to John, who in turn then sold it to another one of his sons, Samuel Cantillon. He, Samuel lived between 1837 and 1925, and Samuel acquired the property in 1870. And it's, uh, Samuel's name appears on this property in the uh, 1877 Historical Atlas of Peel County. In 1909, Samuel Cantillon sold the property to his son, Samuel Herbert Cantillon, who lived between 1884 and 1965. Uh, Samuel, uh, he went by the name Herbert, but Samuel Herbert Cantillon was a bachelor and remained for the, uh, the rest of his life on the property. Um, in 1948, uh, the property was granted to uh, John Nixon. Uh, Samuel continued to reside in the house before he passed away and uh, was connected most closely with Streetsville and Trinity Anglican Church in Streetsville. Uh, John, uh, John H. Nixon sold the property to Air Mills Development Corps less than 10 years later uh, in 1956 uh, and uh, under the development name of Havendale Investments Limited. Nixon retained a lifetime lease on the property until his death in 1971. Havendale Investments Limited were transferred to Markborough Properties Limited and the property was leased to North Haven Farms. Markborough Properties Limited developed, developed the Meadowville area between the 1970s and 1980s. The former Cantillon Nixon Farmhouse, which is believed to have been built by William Cantillon in 1862, stood within the modern schoolyard of what is, uh, what is, what is your school at, uh, at uh, West Credit Secondary School. Uh, what is fascinating, if you're looking for kind of ghosts of the past, uh, is uh, the site of the of the of the farmhouse itself was never built upon, and it can still be found within the schoolyard if you look at uh, at aerial maps. The house itself, again built between uh, around 1862, was torn down between 1976 and 1979. The school itself was built between 1984 and 1985. Uh, the Canelons, who uh, farmed here the longest in terms of a multi generational family, operated a mixed farm including cattle and sheep and market garden produce. It's said that Samuel Cantillon went, went to market with produce more often than any other farmer in the vicinity. 
Uh, and again, the, the house was demolished between 1976 and 1979 to make way for the development of the site and the creation of the school in 1985. And the site of the farmhouse can still be found on the school property. Uh, the, the grove of trees that uh, once surrounded the farmhouse still survive on, uh, on aerial photography. And, uh, and uh, so ghosts of the past indeed, uh, not only names on the landscape that connect back to an indigenous history, but also the ghosts of Fifth Line and the location of the, the former farmhouse. Uh, hard to see on the modern context, but uh, aerial photography uh, uh, it gives us some indication of, of where things might have been. Um, and uh, you also were asking about uh, the nearby Mullet Creek, and the Mullet Creek, of course, a tributary of the Credit River. Uh, the Mullet Creek uh, supposedly was named for a fish species that was once dominant in its waters. And uh, as we know, the Mullet Creek now flows through a heavily industrial area and uh, um, is, uh, is, a, is a challenged landscape today. Um, Mullet Creek was once the site of, uh, of a mill complex by James Blendinning closer to Streetsville, uh, one of our earliest, if not the first, uh, mill complex to operate within historic Mississauga in the early 1820s. Uh, so Mullet Creek, a part of a landscape that has greatly altered, but the water still flows. Um, and uh, it, it uh, nearby Wabakane Creek fa follows the same kind of course as a tributary into the Credit River watershed. Uh, but these were, were bodies of water that were known by uh, the Canalons and others, of, of kind of early settlers on the landscape, and indeed by the indigenous Mississaugas who came before them. So we have those ties on the landscape. and. Uh, uh, I hope that uh, does a little bit towards uh, answering your question about the, the curiosity of the history of the West, uh, the uh, of the school site of of, of your school at uh, West Credit Secondary School. So thank you for your question, Matthew. Our final question comes from one of our more curious followers, Carter. And Carter would like to know: Has anyone from Mississauga ever won the Stanley Cup? Thank you, Carter, for your question. And uh, it, it's always an intriguing one. I can't say that I have uh, the entirety of all the answers here, a little bit of vague in terms of uh, researching some of the, uh, the questions here. But uh, uh, the, the NHL reference database uh, currently lists 32 former and active NHL players who hail from Mississauga. And there's a long list of names here, and we'll quickly read them off. Uh, Don, uh, Don Biggs, Brad Boys, David Brohl, Kyle uh, Capo Bianco, Michael Caruso, uh, Matthew Corrent, uh, Jamie Devane, Robbie Fabry, Greg Gilbert, Cody Golubeff, Ken Hammond, Tom Kotstopoulos, uh, Bill McDougall, Michael McLeod, Ryan McLeod, Manny Malhotra, Grant Marshall, Sean Mathias, Nick Paul, uh, Stephen Pinizzato, John Ramage, Zach Ronaldo, Alan Rourke, Mike Sands, Jeff Chevalier, Jason Spezza, Ryan Sp uh, Sproul, Matt Stajan, Dylan Strom, Ryan Strom, Tony Tonti, and John Tavares. According to uh, quanthockey.com, this group has won a total of 15 gold medals, 11 silver, 9 bronze, 5 Calder Cup championships, 1 World Cup, and 5 Stanley Cups. And those are people that were born and raised in, uh, in Mississauga, or at least born in Mississauga. Um, this had me pondering other aspects of uh, Mississauga's connections to the game of hockey. And uh, in terms of women's hockey, Canada, uh, hockey Canada lists 13 players with ties to Mississauga, including Kelly Babstock, Alyssa Balden, uh, Courtney Burchard, uh, Courtney Burchard, uh, Michelle Bonello, uh, Jamie Bourbonnais, Samantha Holmes, Domagala. Christina Kessler, Nadine Muzzerall, Cheryl Pounder, Leslie Redden, Megan Sittler, Laura Stacy, and Rebecca Vint. Most players played for the uh, national team in international tournament, tournaments and the Olympics, as well as the CWHL and the NWHL. From the statistics I was able to search on, on these players, this group of 13 athletes has amassed some, an incredible total of 21 gold medals, 14 silver, 3 bronze, 1 Abby Hoffman Cup, and 3 Clarkson Cup championships. Additional links between Mississauga and professional hockey are found in Birth to Millennium, Mississauga Sports Heritage by Mike Toth, which lists the following players who played professionally in a number of different leagues. Anthony Aquino, uh, Luciano Aquino, Matt Becca, Jeff Brown, Kevin Brown, Gord Brideson, uh, uh, Jeff Kaster, Glenn Harmon, uh, Jeff uh, Kurzakos, Ryan Munsey, Chris Sparr, D uh, Dean Strong, Philip Tomasino, and TJ Tr Trevelyan. 
Other notable collections to our city in professional hockey can be found within those that were born elsewhere but deliver, uh, develop links in our community either during their playing career or as a place of residence after their playing careers were over. These include, of course, our famed Johnny Bauer, Don Cherry, Casey Sizakis, Paul Coffey, Rick Dudley, Dick Duff, Han, uh, Hank Goldup, uh, Paul Henderson, Bill Flash Hollett, Ed Boxcar Hospodar, Steve Montador, Hugh Plaxton, Dave Poulin, Joe Primo, John Peanuts O'Flaherty, Larry Patey, and Lauren Smith. These are some remarkable names when you look at the, the roster of, the, of, of uh, well-remembered uh, hockey players in the Hockey Hall of Fame. The personal and team awards are almost too many, too many to list. Paul Coffey alone, who recently had his name attached to a park and arena in Malton, where he grew up, had an exceptional career winning four Stanley Cups and three Canada Cups. Paul Henderson is, of course, best known for the 1972 Summit Series, and Johnny Bauer has a special place in the hearts of hockey fans after winning four Stanley Cups with the Toronto Maple Leafs. Looking back even further, however, brought to mind uh, a book uh, on the Dixie Arena Gardens and the Dixie Beehives by Dave Cook. Uh, remarkably, uh, uh, again, uh, called From Frozen Ponds to Beehive Glory by Dave Cook. Uh, wonderful book to read if you have a chance to do so. Over 30 players who suited up, uh, suited up for the Dixie Beehives over the years went on to play in the NHL. A significant part of the chronicle of the Dixie Beehives is the story of the Stanfield brothers, Jack, Fred, Jim, and Vic Stanfield all played professional hockey. Jack, Fred, and Jim all played in the NHL, with Fred having the longest career, appearing in over 900 games and winning the Stanley Cup twice with the Boston Bruins. Finally, at least from what I've able to, been able to uncover, Burt Pierre of Port Credit played professional hockey between 1932 and 1948, playing for 11 different professional teams, including one game for the Detroit Red Wings in the NHL. From newspaper accounts, Burt's career was followed with great interest in the local community. All of these have and continue to make Mississauga very proud. And so, yes, there are uh, athletes and uh, hockey players from Mississauga, Carter, to get back to your question, that have won the Stanley Cup. And uh, and uh, we're, we're, we're glad to be able to uh, chronicle at least a little part of their story here. So thank you once again for joining us for, with Ask a Historian. And keep sending in your questions as we continue to explore the stories of our city each and every week here at Ask a Historian. Do not forget to like and subscribe and stay connected with us here at Heritage Mississauga. Thank you.